All right, CMT 125, Chapter 8, we're on the section on VLANs. I do have a couple slides right before this that is a review of some switch concepts that were covered in Chapter 7, so I put them there as a refresher for you. Uh, if need be, go back and review those in Chapter 7. Let's now take a look at VLANs. Before we do that, reminder about subnets. Uh, remember, the whole point of doing subnets is we had one large network here. Uh, we showed that earlier with you know, a whole bunch of switches. And by putting in a router or layer 3 switch on each floor, I could allocate a small subnet of IP addresses to each floor. And now that took the large network that was here and broken into three smaller ones. And this is uh, containing traffic here so it doesn't interfere with other floors. It's containing broadcast traffic here so it doesn't you know, interfere with other floors, other pieces of the network. That's the reason we were doing that with subnets. Now, with VLANs, I'm going to do a similar concept, but virtual, virtual LANs, it doesn't, I don't have to be as worried about the physical location of things. So with the VLAN, I'm going to group ports on a switch, so they are forced, their traffic is forced to go through a router, and a router now does the dividing like we did with the, the subnets before. It's going to divide up the traffic, break up the traffic into these broadcast domains. Uh, so the boundaries can be almost defined where I want them logically if you will so I can have as we had before we had the router with a switch on each floor I can actually define a VLAN where it cuts across multiple floors I can take groups of users on each floor and put them together in a VLAN or I could I like to use the example of maybe the computers on these floors are all in a VLAN and maybe the IP phones on all these floors are in a VLAN maybe all the wireless users on all these floors this is in a separate VLAN and I'm, I'm grouping things off by type of device by type of device um, so I can do this virtually logically now and I don't have to worry about dealing with everything physically on the entire floor here I can break it out by type of thing that's what VLANs are going to allow me to do. Well, why? what are some reasons for using VLANs? Um, I can actually give groups of users uh, maybe priority. Maybe I have some industrial controls for heating, ventilation, that sort of thing for manufacturing equipment that that traffic needs to take priority. It's always got to work. Um, I can isolate certain types of traffic, maybe voice or video, um, so that I can maybe make sure that that traffic doesn't interfere with other traffic, or I make sure that it gets quality, quality of service, uh, uh, to be able to butt in front of maybe some of the other data traffic. Um, I can isolate groups of devices, maybe some old equipment, so that traffic does not interfere with newer uh, equipment, maybe, maybe secure off the older stuff. Um, I can separate groups of users, maybe a guest network, wireless network, uh, so they have limited security. You know, maybe wireless users, guest wireless users in their own VLAN. Um, I could do a temporary network, short-term project, put all those users in this little VLAN f with certain levels of permissions. Um, and this also can help with reducing the cost of things. I don't need to have a router on each floor. I can configure the switches to do the same type of thing. So virtual LANs. I'm going to logically separate the network within the network, uh, and I'm going to group ports into a broadcast domain. This can be done on switches, usually managed switches, we'll mention in a minute. Um, I can do it statically by assigning port numbers. I can take certain port numbers and put them in a VLAN. Or I could do dynamically. Um, the typical way to do that would be by MAC address. It might even be by location. Uh, maybe a user coming in that we don't know they're in that certain VLAN, we just allocate them. Uh, but commonly, things like a MAC address can get used. Now, I am going to need a server or software to do that because I literally need a table of these MAC addresses go in this VLAN, these MAC addresses go in this VLAN. But that allows things or devices or people to move around and they still maintain their VLAN status. Uh, phone moves to another floor, boom, it's still in that VLAN, uh, phone VLAN. The thing we need to remember is each VLAN is its own broadcast to me. That's why we're doing that. Their traffic is isolated from everybody else. Well, here's where I like to use a practical example. If I have a switch and I have three different types of users in the same switch, 
if I look at this carefully, the wired users, the IP phones, and the wireless users, all their traffic is mingling on this switch. Um, there's some concern, security concerns there. Because, again, I like to pick one. I'll pick on Mr. Brown. If Mr. Brown hooks his laptop up, how do you know Mr. Brown isn't doing, like, Wireshark and other stuff on the traffic? Now, Mr. Brown is not doing any hacking in. But just giving the example, how do you know that the wireless user hooking up to your network is not doing those types of things? Um, so that's really kind of like a concern, security concern. I want to separate these groups of users out. Well, I could put a router in here and separate them out and have the router, you know, separate this traffic out. It makes sense. It would, it would, it would accomplish the goal. Um, I can add the security in. I can add the the rules on the router to limit traffic. However, most routers only have two ports. Most commercial routers only have two ports, kind of like an in and an out. Extra ports, I can get them, but they are pretty pricey. I can get extra ports, but they are pretty pricey. So in many cases, this this is a solution, but in many cases, it's not a practical solution. So what typically gets done is we separate these groups out at the switch level with VLANs, and we have the router program to understand those VLANs. That way, as traffic moves from the switch up to the router, the router can, we can program to can that it can communicate to another VLAN, or we can put rules in to say, no, we're going to limit that. We're going to say, no, that cannot communicate there. Your wireless user, uh-uh, you're not going to communicate over there. So adding the router in, putting the VLANs here to separate them, passing the traffic to the router and the router ha uh, being there to read that traffic, we can program the router to say, yes, you can communicate or no, you can't. Or yes, you can if you're this protocol, but no, you can't if you're this, 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 or this. Um, that is typically how it's done. This, called, this is called inter-VLAN routing. We are going to do VLAN communication and, and configuration. Then we are eventually going to work our way up to uh, inter-VLAN by adding the router in. We are going to work our way up to that in our next handful of labs. Well, the advantage of VLANs, as you just saw there, I really only need that one router. I don't have to worry about all those extra ports. Um, I can have flexibility. Of, I can actually have ports from different switches be in the same VLAN. Um, I'll show that in a little bit here with some other pictures. Uh, I can have uh, any node type can be in the same VLAN or different VLANs. I have less equipment that I need, and I do have some broadcast control and some security. Some downside, though, is it is additional configuration. It's configuration you can get wrong, too. Um, and most times I'm going to need that layer 3 device for inter-VLAN. Inter and again, that's additional configuration, things I could additionally get wrong. It is not foolproof. It is prone to VLAN hopping attacks. Uh, that's mentioned uh, later on in the chapter, VLAN hopping attacks. Um, so it is not It is not immune. It is not immune. Uh, it has its own problems. Now, to do this, we are going to need a managed switch. Hopefully, remember, the unmanaged is the kind of switch that you might get for, like, home use. Um, it's kind of a plug-and-play switch. I really am not able to browse in to configure it. Um, so, therefore, it's usually not able to do VLANs. Meanwhile, a managed switch is the kind you would literally connect into with like a console cable command line and configure it. Um, it might have some pre-configured stuff in it, but usually I need to configure it and I usually need to assign an IP address and I usually need to go and run commands on it to put VLANs on um, and create the VLANs and put ports in them and etc. Again, we are going to do this in the lab room with our switches that we have on our equipment rack. Um, some of them you can browse in and do it through clicking click uh, clicking in tabs uh, most of them are going to be through command line which I think I showed down here in a little bit oh I gotta get my head of myself I literally need to do some command line to put those VLANs in uh, and again I'll show that in a little bit let me back up here Boop. okay so there's kind of browsing in uh, some will allow you to do that uh, I can actually grab certain ports and put them in a VLAN here's port in VLAN 2 Here's two ports in VLAN 10, here's a port in VLAN 20, and so forth. The three over here in VLAN 30, just as an example. That is one way I can do that. M switches that we work with most of the times are layer 2, um, and it's going to sort the traffic at layer 2, uh, and the VLANs are just simply going to separate them out uh, to divide, basically not allow communication between them. That's what we're going to start with when we configure VLANs. We'll start with just putting some VLANs on and limiting the traffic flow between. So on a normal layer 2 switch, 
the switch is going to manage all the network traffic on the LAN unless a host wants to communicate with a host on another network that's going to go through a router. That's just normal switch traffic. When I add the VLAN in, this is now not going to allow, you know, traffic here. Computer A cannot talk to computer B. It can't do it unless I add the router up here that will understand these VLANs and allow communication between them. And that's the configuration we need to add on the router up here. And that's what they call the router on a stick. I literally need to configure the router to understand these VLANs and pass traffic between them. Several sports on a, uh, ports on a switch can be assigned to VLAN 1, some can be assigned to VLAN 2, and I, they don't have to be next to each other, they can be scattered throughout. This would be a static VLAN assignment, I'm grabbing ports and putting them in a VLAN. As traffic moves from switch to switch, I now need a way to identify which VLAN it came from so it knows, can I deliver this to another switch port, yes or no. So that is done through what's called VLAN tagging or frame tagging. Um, the IEEE 802.1Q standard specified the use of frame tagging. Um, I like to think of it this way. Think of it as almost like a luggage tag. Um, when you get to the airport, it's added to the luggage. That tag gets used to move the luggage from plane to plane, from airport to airport until it gets to the destination airport and you pick it up. Once you pick it up, that tag is pretty much useless and you usually tear it off. That's exactly what's happening with frame tags. As traffic goes to leave a VLAN, the switch goes, I better tag this. And as it moves from switch to router to switch and so forth, that tag is on there so it knows what, who can I pass this to? What VLAN can I pass this to? Once it gets the destination switch and passes it out to a device on that VLAN port, it'll tear that tag off. It's no longer needed. That's what the IEEE 802.1Q frame tagging is about. Sometimes you'll see this referred to as .1Q. We will see it referred to as .1Q when we configure the routers for inner VLAN. We literally type the command .1Q to say we are using frame tagging, recognize frame tagging. Uh, an or ordinary Ethernet frame looks like so. When we do frame tagging, this extra uh, frame field, header field, gets slid in there. It kind of gets jammed in there uh, to identify what VLAN it came from and where is it going to. Um, you, you, that actually gets added in there. That's why I said it almost like a luggage tag. So with manual switches, um, I can actually have VLAN 1 assigned on this switch, and I can have VLAN 1 assigned on this switch. So as V1 VLAN 1 traffic goes into this switch, it'll get tagged, this switch reads it, this switch reads it, this switch reads it, and out to this VLAN 1 user. That VLAN tagging is going to allow that to communicate. If VLAN 1 needs to communicate with VLAN 3, it'll get sent here, across here to this switch, to this router. The router will read that tag and go, I need to pass it back here, here, and boom, over to VLAN 3, if it's allowed to do so. It's going to use the router to do that. Uh, eventually, we will configure our router to understand those VLAN tags and pass that traffic. I'm going to pause there. When I come back, we'll start talking about VLAN configuration on our devices.